Oh, <clears throat> Energy 808. Uh, Hawaii, the cutting edge. Here we are with Marco Mangelsdorf, and he is in what? Hanoi today, right? Did I get that right? Capital of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, Hanoi. So a very pleasant uh, Sien Tau to you in uh, Vietnamese. Yes, and it's uh, what, 300 kilometers from the, the border with China? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Maybe a little bit less, yeah. And, and that means that uh, that border is porous in the sense that it's not closed now. Uh, and uh, it's, it's always a, an important commercial entry point for the Chinese who, who are important tourists. And tourism is a, an important part of the Vietnamese economy. So they're still coming in. And therefore, uh, and it's not that far from Wuhan and all. So there's still a certain risk, um, you know, in Vietnam, especially northern Vietnam. I hate to tell you this, especially Hanoi. Uh, but I'm sure you've been thinking about that. So we can, can we talk about it? Tell me what you're thinking. Sure. I actually sat down with uh, four of our uh, fine foreign service officers yesterday at the U.S. Embassy talking about energy. And of course, you know, the kind of the prelude to many conversations is talking about the coronavirus. And uh, Vietnam shut down uh, air traffic with uh, China 100%. A uh, week or two ago, uh, the border, as you mentioned, they share a border, their northern border and a, and a southern border with China. Uh, and that has also constricted greatly in terms of the, the free flow of people and goods has been vastly uh, restricted. And the I, I'm going by memory here. I believe there were somewhere between 12 to 20 cases so far of coronavirus uh, detected here in Vietnam and none in Hanoi. Uh, and uh, understandably, those cases that have been detected have all been in and around the border region. So uh, the, the Vietnamese authorities are taking things very, very seriously and uh, being a lot more uh, restrictive of, of, like I said, the free flow of, of people and and goods across the border. You know, one thing that um, the, the paper reported that Xi Jinping, um, his opinion is that, and I don't know exactly what science it's based on, is that as, as the season gets warmer, you know, into May and June, uh, and the temperature gets warmer, the virus does not do as well then. Um, and that could that could slow it down. You heard anything like that? Do you believe that? Oh, uh, no, I have not. I've been pretty voraciously keeping up with multiple news sources and, and I'm not being, neither of us being an epidemiologist. Uh, I believe uh, one of the, the main reasons why uh, the, the flu season uh, peaks during the winter time for us and the colder months for us is that uh, people are spending more time in close quarters. Uh, whereas when it's warmer, they're outside more and therefore uh, interacting less with people in a very close fashion, perhaps to some degree. So I, I know nothing uh, as far as whether you know, ambient temperature uh, or what the, what the best ambient temperature range is for this particular virus or, or other flu type viruses. Uh, so I'm uh, beyond that. Uh, Dr. J, I, 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 I don't know. Okay, well, I mean, let me say that uh, here in Honolulu, if you want to buy hand, hand sanitizer and you go to Walmart, the shelf is empty, not a single bottle. I did that personally myself this morning. And if you go to Long's Drug Store here downtown, not a single bottle, the shelf is empty. So uh, whatever m m drives people, probably fear, um, they they have bought up all the hand sanitizer in the in this, and I think masks are also gone. Uh, one short supply issue, which I'm really not familiar with, I mean I don't know the status of it, is the test kits. Uh, you know, uh, when I talked to uh, the Department of Health last week, they said there was no way to diagnose this. Um, I I don't believe that's so. I think there is a way to diagnose it, and I think there are test kits out there, but. The test kits are in such short supply, it's, it's very hard predictably to get them. Um, you know, they talk about confirmed cases. Well, how do they confirm it? There must be a way to confirm the case. 
um, anyway, this is this is going around the world. The UK, the UK decided today that it was a, a I don't know an emergency. Um, Hong Kong obviously, you know, has had a number of cases and, and deaths too. I think Hong Kong they found two cases in an apartment building, ten stories apart. So they closed the whole apartment building. Um, that's that's a little bit heavy, but that's what they did. Now all those people are out of a out of home. Um, so I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of fear, a lot of overreaction, if you will, happening, especially in Asia, Asia, but in other places too. And my question to you is, uh, uh, do you foresee any challenges getting back to Honolulu? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. I was planning to, and looking forward to spending uh, my last week, which is the first week or so in March, uh, of being in my in my favorite Chinese city of Shanghai there on the, on the East Sea. And uh, a week or 10 days ago, it just became beyond abundantly clear that, you know, even if I could get there, if I could get into Shanghai flying from Chiang Mai, Thailand, uh, then I would need to eventually get out. Uh, I would, and that my plan is to fly to Seoul, South Korea, and then catch a flight to Honolulu. And uh, I, I had doubts as to, number, well, I mean, fundamentally, did I want to go to a city that is under uh, also its version of lockdown, where people are holed up in their, their places, in their homes? Did I, did I want to subject myself to that, you know? And, and it just became very clear that that did not make sense. So uh, I canceled my trip to, to Shanghai, and uh, I, I can't foresee the circumstances where the United States or ASEAN Airlines would stop service between Seoul and, and Honolulu. So I just have to get myself to Seoul and, and get home. So to answer your question, Jay, uh, unless things change very dramatically, uh, I can't see a uh, problem in getting home. I'll be going back to, to my, uh, my home, as I call it, in Luang Prabang tomorrow, and then uh, Cambodia, Phnom Penh, which also has some cases, but uh, very few, and then uh, Thailand again, and then back to uh, to Seoul. So I uh, I don't think I'll have a problem. Knock on uh, knock on Jade. Yeah, safe travels on that. So I hope you'll be back with us uh, two weeks hence. Is that tell me you, you will? Uh, I most likely will be in uh, in Chiang Mai, so we can uh, pick it up from uh, from northern Thailand. Okay, great. And let's talk about uh, Southeast Asia and energy. Uh, we've shared articles uh, about what's happening on the Mekong, and um, and I passed you an article about what's happening on the Nile, believe it or not. Yeah. And it's all about water, and it's all about um, you know the environment, uh, and it's all about elect uh, hydroelectric because that's a big issue on the Nile as well as the Mekong. Can you talk about what's going on in Southeast Asia? Yeah, first, I think you're, you know, you're absolutely right that the, uh, the backdrop is water, uh, the, the, the value of water, the, uh, the commodity of water, the necessity of water, and it especially becomes more dicey when, when there's not enough water. And a number of, of writers and scholars and, and uh, deep thinkers over the years or, or longer have been um, pondering and, and researching uh, coming water scarcity uh, for much of the world, affecting as many as perhaps two billion people, uh, which is uh, nothing to, uh, to to sneeze at, of course. So I think these issues are going to get nothing but incredibly more pronounced and and oftentimes dire. And in the case of the lower Mekong or sub Mekong region, which uh, in, comprises of, of Lao, the Lao PDR, Laos People's Democratic Republic, uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, the uh, rib rivers, the main river, rivers, uh, rivers like the Irrawaddy and Mekong and other tributaries are of vital importance to the, uh, the livelihoods of tens of millions of people. And, and you know, there are 245 million people or so in the five countries I just mentioned, which is uh, you know, quite a bit of humanity. 
and the, the, the water flowing from north to south, starting uh, in the case of the Mekong and the high altitudes of southern China and uh, the Tibetan Plateau and, uh, and Yunnan province, those waters, as they wind their way down thousands of miles uh, to the delta area uh, south uh, of, of uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, are, are incredibly uh, vitally important to, to tens of millions of people and, and their, uh, their fishing, their protein intake, their commerce. And there, there's already a, a very serious, very serious drought across Southeast Asia. So there, there's less water to begin with. Is and that climate change? Is, uh, Probably, I mean, they're calling it an El Nino year, uh, but I mean, we seem to be getting a lot of uh, of these droughts, which statistically people have been telling us, oh, this is a one in 100 year drought, or this is a one in 20 year drought. And these one in 100 year droughts, you know, lo and behold, they're happening every two or three years. So, you know, the, the stats are failing us, Jay, uh, as far as, uh, you know, the, the real life conditions uh, on the ground across Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, climate change is real and it's having a very serious uh, impact. And one of, one of the things that uh, is happening in the Nile is that Egypt's population is growing very quickly. Uh, and the article that I that I uh, saw and sent you uh, talked about that as one of the one of the elements uh, that that made this so volatile uh, and that uh, degraded the, uh, the river. Um, is that the same thing in Southeast Asia? Is it that the population in, say, in Vietnam uh, is more than it was and, and increasing, uh, and, and that affects um, the use of the river and the dependency of all those countries on the river? Well, the, the, the more or less current population of Vietnam is, uh, is a few million under 100 million. And I believe it's 97 million as of last year. And more than half of those people, uh, so if you do the math, you're talking, let's say, roughly you know, 48, 49 million people, more than half of those people were born, have been born since 1975, mm -hmm. which is when the, uh, the country was re reunified. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you go back uh, 45 years to so 1979, uh, 1975, and uh, uh, going from roughly, you know, 40 some odd million of the population in the country then to more than double that 45 years later, is that uh, a hefty population growth? I, I would say yes. And, and the Vietnamese, you know, to a broad generalization, the Vietnamese are hardworking, industrious. My gosh, you know, walking around the streets of Saigon or ha uh, Hanoi, and the, the, you know, it's kind of a frenetic pace. Lots of vendors, street vendors, stores, people walking the streets, both locals and tourists. You know, and it's it's definitely turned into a heavy, heavy, heavy consumer-based society. And that so includes construction people. of new new buildings uh, and new infrastructure, and that that requires uh, concrete, and concrete requires sand. And I remember a piece that I saw a few months ago uh, about um, developers uh, pulling sand out of the Mekong. Uh, and uh, dredging the sand out in large quantities, this also has a, a, a negative effect on the quality of the river and the future of the river. And I saw that in the article you sent me too, that sand and removing sand from you know, all these juncture points in the river is a big problem. Uh, how, but in how fact, important is it? Well, in fact, Jay, it's interesting you should mention that because uh, in Cambodia, the uh, export or the sale the making off with, so to speak, of sand has been made illegal by the uh, the government in Phnom Penh. And that hasn't stopped, unfortunately, that has not stopped the continued practice of, uh, shall we say, unscrupulous people continuing to sell sand by by the megatons uh, for money to, to, uh, to the construction trades. Uh, and the Chinese, of course, have got a very heavy presence in in Cambodia and a place like Sihanoukville, which is on the coast there. So, yeah, I mean, who would have thought that there would be a scarcity of sand? But, yeah, these governments are recognizing that that this cannot continue, and they're trying to trying to cut down on it, trying to outlaw it. But, uh, 
you know, where there's the will and there's money to be made. Unfortunately, often there's the way. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the Chinese are involved in financing some of those projects, including the uh, the big dam and dams. Um, they're also involved in, in uh, controlling the waters at the headwaters uh, on the Chinese side. And uh, if they if they were to tighten that up, uh, that would all in itself would create a big problem for everybody, you know, downstream. So I wonder, you know, I mean, how how much have the Chinese got their hand on this? Uh, not only in the construction of infrastructure and the motivation to do dams uh, and in the control of the headwaters. Well, you bring up an excellent point, and there they are very much part of this consultative group and, and bodies and commissions uh, with the lower Mekong, the five countries, lower Mekong. Uh, the Chinese are very much involved because, as you just pointed out, uh, there are a number of mega dams on the upper Mekong that the, the Chinese can control the water flow, right? So there have been a number of times over the past months and years where the lower uh, Mekong countries, one or more of them will say, hey, uh, could you please release more water? And uh, to my knowledge, the Chinese have been uh, cooperative. They have been uh, willing to do that, which has provided, and uh, you know, at important times, some, some relief to the downstream countries. So, you know, it, it's extremely political. And uh, one of the interesting things, and, and maybe uh, you can show the image uh, of, uh, that I sent uh, this past week, is that there is a, a dam being proposed about 20, 25 kilometers uh, north uh, or upstream of, uh, of Luang Prabang. And then you have the image on the screen there. So that is the proposed dam site of what would be somewhere over a 1500 megawatt 1.5 gigawatt uh, dam, and it would essentially be kind of a uh, a run of the river dam as opposed to a great big tall high dam, uh, which would have less of an effect from what as I understand, less of an effect than a great big tall high dam in terms of sediment flow and, and fish uh, migration. And then there's the map of, uh, of the Mekong uh, across Southeast Asia, and it, it's, it's a very, uh, very in instructive map in terms of showing the number of dams both existing and planned from north to south and the the lao government so, so, or somebody at some point in the past decades said gee we could become the battery of asia the battery of asia with all these uh, hydropower dams and we could use these dams as a way of, uh, of earning export dollars, uh, selling power. And, and, and the, the discussion over the Luang Prabang Dam, which uh, uh, is generating a tremendous amount of discussion. In fact, just last week, there was a meeting in Luang Prabang, which I did not attend, a meeting of the uh, Mekong River Commission, which is uh, the consultative body that's rel relatively toothless, uh, consultative body made up of the lower Mekong countries. And it was a meeting there at the Pullman Hotel, I know a number of people who went, and uh, you know the, the Lao government gives every indication that they want to move forward with this this dam, and uh, of course you need money to do that. And right now the money, if it happens, Jay, the money would come from the Thais, uh, who are in need of uh, more electricity as well over time, and the Vietnamese. <clears throat> And the people I've been talking to uh, have observed that you know, this particular dam would, would sell power uh, with transmission lines going west and south. And west and south of Luang Prabang happens to be Thailand. Uh, and to the east of Luang Prabang is, is Vietnam, but there are no transmission lines at present between the Luang Prabang area and Vietnam. And to do so, to construct these transmission lines would be, uh, would add to the cost of the project, uh, I won't say perhaps exponentially, but add substantially. So the question is posed, why would the Vietnamese, which are many state-backed companies, why would the Vietnamese be involved, <clears throat> excuse me, be involved in another, uh, in a major dam project on the upper Mekong 
that if completed by pretty much everybody's account, if completed would have a negative to very negative impact on the the millions of Vietnamese downstream of this dam once once the Mekong gets to Vietnam and especially the Mekong River Delta area. Why would the Chinese why would the Vietnamese be in support of a dam that would be kind of cutting the you know cutting their nose to spite their face? Why, why would they? And the answer I'm getting to that. <laughs> why would they is is because not because it would be necessarily good for a Vietnamese interest in the in the the lower Mekong area, but because if they bail, the Chinese would be right behind the door. They're willing to step in, and 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 take over that position. So, from a geopolitical perspective, the Vietnamese are not willing at this point, at least, to back out out of fear that if they were to do that. It would open the door for Chinese participation in this project. That makes so a that lot of shows, sense. Jay, that shows that the 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 relationships amongst the the countries here is multi layered, very complex, uh, very complicated, and very rife with intrigue and and plotting in terms of. Oh, well, this may not necessarily be in our best interest to move forward with this project, but we sure as heck don't want to allow the Chinese to step in uh, and, and have anything to do with this. So yeah. it's pretty wild, Jay. It's, it's really well, quite And, quite and a, a fundamental point is that they all distrust China, probably with good cause. I mean, after all, Vietnam had a war with China after the American War. <clears throat> so, uh, but let me, let me go to two things you were talking about. You know, one is what about the notion of uh, Vietnam simply investing in what looks like a, a profitable project. I mean, surely for their investment, they'll get a return on their on their capital. Wouldn't that justify? Uh, and I want to get to the, you know, the environmental considerations and problems later. But wouldn't that justify um, making the investment if they got a return from the sale, for example, of, of all this hydropower to, uh, you know, to the lower end of the Mekong uh, and to Thailand and so forth? <clears throat> Well, uh, that is on the positive side of the ledger, okay, is you, you, you spring for part of the construction costs and the financing for a mega project like this, and uh, you make money doing it. On the uh, negative side of the ledger is the, the widespread consensus on the part of other parties in Vietnam uh, as well as uh, parties in Cambodia and and also uh, other parties in Laos that uh, have very serious and legitimate concerns that the, another dam on the main of the Mekong above Luang Prabang would negatively affect the lives and the livelihoods of tens of millions of people downstream, including millions of people in the River Delta region of uh, not far from Ho Chi Minh City. Well, how does that work? You know, so, I mean, is it environmental? Uh, would it, it deprive them of their agriculture? I mean, what what exactly uh, are we talking about when we say that they they oppose the dam, they oppose the um, the hydro projects on the river? What would happen, in fact, to them? What's the negative there? Well, there's increasing salinity, for one thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, over uh, as less water is coming eventually down into the East River, or excuse me, into the East Sea, which is off the, the Delta region. So uh, that's a very serious concern. They're, they are drawing, because there's less river coming down the Mekong, there's a drawing down of ground water, as in drill, 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 and suck, it, suck up the water that is deep underground, mm -hmm. which as we both know, you keep on doing that, keep on doing that, keep on doing that. It leads to a, a, a uh, subsidiz no, the subsidization, that's not the right word. The, 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 the ground level actually starts to sink mm -hmm. because the water on which the ground was resting on, you know, which was acting as, as, a, as, a, as a support to the, the, the megatons of earth above yeah, like it. Like in California, you know, Cali that's happening in California right now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So 
that is happening. And, and we're, so the more that happens in the region, uh, and, and as seawater levels rise, you know, some of the projected maps of the Mekong River Delta area in and around Ho Chi Minh City uh, over the next decades shows more and more of that entire region effectively going underwater. But all that not, notwithstanding, despite all of the problems that people see in the environmental issues, agricultural issues, water issues, um, you know, fact is this is going ahead. This project is likely to be completed for economic reasons, <clears throat> geopolitical reasons, uh, uh, who knows, corruption reasons, it's going ahead. And, and when it goes ahead, then there'll be a piper to pay at the end of the line. And what piper will that be? I mean, in the case of the Nile, um, there are clear threats uh, between Egypt and Ethiopia of war over the Nile, over the hydropower and the water and the agriculture. Same list of, of awfuls, same problems in the Nile. You know, this is like a global phenomenon here. Um, so what would happen, though, in the worst case analysis, they go ahead with the project, they ignore these side effects, if you will. Uh, are they facing war also? Are they facing water shortages that, that are going to, you know, wreck the relations with these, these various countries? Well, I'm going to push back on a little, a little bit of that, Jay, which is to say that uh, there are quite a few people and groups who are far from resigned to uh, to fighting this this proposed dam above Luang Prabang, and there are a number of, a number of examples in the region, including a dam that was proposed in Cambodia called the Sambor Dam, which uh, was eventually fought and killed by enough opposition to effectively stop this particular dam project. So uh, I, I don't believe that. Uh, uh, the folks who are opposed to the dam have given up. Uh, you know that said, the Lao government. Uh, I read a piece in the Vientiane Times just a couple of days ago, uh, which is one of the English language newspapers in, in Vientiane, the capital of Lao, and it made every you know uh, indication that the government, uh, according to the, the piece, was was still you know very much moving forward with with this dam, but uh, there is a case for hope and optimism that. Uh, a dam like this can be, especially uh, in, in light of water levels being more suspect or more at risk uh, now and in the decades to come. Uh, I think the case can be made that it is possible, it could be possible to fight this dam and, yeah. and, 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 and stop it. Well, so this is, I, I this is a really this interesting problem on the Mekong as it is on the Nile. And what that tells us is that the great rivers of the world are under, under attack. There will be political political discussion and debate and argument about it, who, who knows what. It's something we have to watch. I'm so glad you're there and you can tell us about it and you've met with people, talked with people, uh, and I hope we can discuss it further when you get back, maybe even next week. Um, anyway, Marco, thank you so much. Really enjoy this kind of long-term, long, long distance discussion. And, um, and I think we all benefit by knowing more what happens, uh, more about what happens in Southeast Asia. Have a good trip back. Well, and, and thank you, Jay. You know, I, I appreciate very much, sincerely, I appreciate your, uh, your interest and your willingness, uh, your uh, enthusiasm to, uh, to explore these issues, because although it's thousands of miles away from, from your home and my home in beautiful Hawaii, Nei, I mean, these are issues which ultimately affect our brothers and sisters uh, far away and, and uh, things that are worth discussing. So, uh, you know, kudos to you uh, for, and your staff for doing all this great work over the years with ThinkTech and, uh, and, and f fostering these uh, discussions. I'm very, very pleased to have been uh, a part of, of your ohana all these past years. So thank you. Thank you, Marco. Aloha till next time.